So as mentioned, we have two tasks this afternoon. But first, as I think many of you know, we are where the Minutemen gathered on that April morn, looking down on the old North Bridge. So I call them with us in spirit as we look to the first task for this afternoon, which is to inaugurate the Concord Nobel Prize for Peace, which attempts to address what are the essential prerequisites for peace. We hear cries all day long, we want peace. We know what's been happening with the school shootings. The Concord Nobel Prize for Peace raises the question, what are the essential prerequisites for peace? That is, what does it take to actually get peace? Thoreau said, that is the uncommon school we want. Instead of noblemen, let us have noble villages of men and women. So the Concord Nobel Prize for Peace speaks to the promise of a new world nobility. We met earlier, we had a conversation earlier with one of the panelists who represents regionally the Boy Scouts. And I mentioned to him that while the Nobel Prizes in Sweden and Norway are given either by kings or in Norway in the presence of the King of Norway, in the spirit of our new world nobility, the conquered Nobel Prize for Peace will be given by students in the presence of representatives of Concord's cultural, political, and economic institutions, of which there are now over 60. We want the youth to drive this Concord Nobel Prize for Peace. And so in speaking with the regional head of the Boy Scouts, he said, yes, we have students that I think would be very excited that they're those who've reached the heights in the Boy Scouts. They can't go further. They're juniors, they're seniors. They'd love to get involved, he believes. So this was just the seed of an idea three years ago, but it's taken on life. And when we talk about addressing the essential prerequisites for peace, I think everybody's heard of one of our most all-American of institutions, which is the 4-H club. Head, heart, hands, when they're balanced and working together equals health. Health in the individual, in the body individual, but I'd also say health in the body social. That is our head sphere, our, when our head sphere, our cultural sphere, our heart sphere, our political sphere, in our hands, the economic sphere, to take a simple picture for a moment, when they are in balance, which is what the whole movement for campaign finance reform is about, that it doesn't work when business people buy politicians. When these three spheres in the body social, the cultural sphere, the political sphere and the economic sphere are in balance, then I think one can begin to talk about the promise of peace as a reality. This is obviously hard work, but Eisenhower attempted it in his Middle Way program and throughout the um, centuries in this country and throughout the world, there's been this striving to grasp this promise of balance, which leads to health, which leads to peace. I want to make note of the, to call to mind the panelists, the way the Concord Nobel Prize for Peace works is we have accepted nominations beginning today at noon, one page nominations in the spirit of Thoreau to keep things simple. We invite people to name someone they'd like to nominate. If this was a Nobel Prize, you'd have to be a member of state or a lawyer or a politician to have the honor to nominate a recipient for the Nobel Prize here, any fellow human being can offer a nomination. So we have started receiving nominations as of noon today. The nominations will come in through November 30th. 
So a few months hence. And then the panelists who represent Concord's political, economic and cultural sphere. Not only those that are native to Concord, but a representative from Bank of America, from TD Bank North, joined the panel yesterday. So we have the breadth of institutions in Concord, political, economic and cultural, representatives who will be on the panel, who will then have from December 1st through January 6th to catch up with the one-page nominations that have come in. And then we'll gather on January 6th in Concord with all of the panelists for a meal to reflect on the process this first year, what we've learned in the process. And then those panelists in the economic sphere will go into a conference room, approximately 25, those in the cultural sphere, those in the political sphere. And having reviewed the nominations, they will choose the recipients for the Concord Nobel Prize for Peace. They will then be presented here under the flagpole on July 4th, 2019. And to give you a sense for what the possibilities here are, one of the nominees is someone who five times was nominated for the Nobel Prize for Peace but five times he was turned down. Perhaps the greatest exponent of peace of the last century, Mahatma Gandhi. So to really distinguish what we mean with a conquered Nobel Prize for Peace, this new world nobility, I think the fact that Gandhi posthumously has been um, chosen as a nominee, not yet as a recipient, if it's meant to be, but a nominee really makes a very clear statement about what the Concord Nobel Prize for Peace is about. The Nobel Prize was a fruit of an industrialist, a Swedish industrialist, who made a fortune in armaments and in dynamite, and then went on to establish the prizes. The Concord Nobel Prize for Peace is a gift from, as I mentioned, the whole community, not a single individual, but the representatives of the different churches, the school system, the schools, the League of Women Voters, Rotary, Masons, all of America's, America's institutions that are here in Concord, businesses as well, Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, a remarkable cross-section of institutions are represented in contradistinction to this one individual in Sweden and Norway. So I think the potential is significant for this. But most of all, to address this question is, what are the essential prerequisites for peace? How do we achieve greater peace in the world today? The prizes will be, the final prizes will be determined by the those involved on the panels with input from any citizens. The process isn't closed in any way. But to give an example, the Nobel Prize, a gold medal is given. Since we're talking about the political sphere, the economic sphere, the cultural sphere, we'll be giving a threefold medal, gold, silver, and bronze. We're not speaking of laureates in the case of the Concord Nobel Prize for Peace. Laurel Branch was given in ancient days to victors no less in war. So we've gone to Henry David Thoreau and asked what for him was one of the most peaceful, if I can use that term, of plants. And he speaks of the lily. And so we're working on transforming the word a laureate to a liliot. The Nobel laureates receive diplomas. We will also offer a kind of diploma in the spirit of Louisa May Alcott in Little Women, a hand-stitched diploma. So we're paralleling the gifts of the Nobel Prize, but always in mind with the new world nobility. The recipients, the three that are chosen, will be invited to come to Concord for a week along with the monetary gift we'll be offering to be determined. 
we are be offering an allowance from the children from kindergarten on up they'll have an allowance for the laureates perhaps some of you know that when the statue of liberty was given to this land it had everything but a pedestal and so the task was to create a pedestal which meant to raise money a journalist from New York City who took on the cause he didn't have much luck with those of means with respect to Lady Liberty so he went to the people and the people contributed pennies nickels dimes and so our Statue of Liberty stands high so along with whatever cash prize we don't want to succumb immediately to the temptation although we have now colleagues from Bank of America and TD Bank North and others Dunkin Donuts Starbucks we're not rushing to a major cash award. We might come to that. But we are inviting the children from kindergarten on up to offer an allowance to the recipients. They're invited to come to Concord for a week. And one thing we will offer them is Concord is blessed with many people who are working towards peace in many arenas, such as conflict mediation. So if, for instance, there's a recipient whose work is in the field of conflict resolution, he would have a conquered team to meet with of really very accomplished, well-known individuals who are working in this sphere, who he had come to Concord or she had come to Concord a few days early and had this kind of conquered collegium as part of the work. So once the three panels are completed with 25 citizens in each we then will dot these I's and cross these T's but I wanted to give a little bit of sense of how this will unfold as I think I mentioned in the beginning that the final awards will be presented not by our kings we don't have many left in this country but by students who bear in themselves the future in the presence of Conquer's leaders. So I'd like to speak out the names of those who are now on the panels and then to say a few words about those who've been nominated thus far. Again, not selected. That'll happen on January 6th, but nominated. Um, so we can get a sense of what do we mean when we say individuals who are addressing the essential prerequisites for peace. How are those more than merely words? So I'm going to let sound the names alphabetically of those in the economic panel, the political panel, and the cultural panel. And interestingly, the first one whose last name is Amaral with an A was the first one who joined. So we have, as I say, over 50 leaders in Concord, and three years ago there were none. It was just an idea. But that's also life. Ideas can take on life. So I want to let their names resound. John Amaral, a partner at Omni Properties. David Anderson, whose family goes back to the very beginning of Concord, the proprietor of Main Street Market Cafe. Zura Atias, founder and CEO of the Atias Group Real Estate, a refugee who came from the Mideast to America. Very difficult beginnings. Brian Anthony, an entrepreneur. John Boynton from one of Concord's old families who's the principal of Firehouse Capital. Chris Carrier, the president of Concord Alpha Graphics. Leanne Crimmings with TD Bank North. Doug Detweiler, retired business owner and former district, district governor of Rotary. Chris Economo, retired vice president of Caldwell Bankers. Susan D. from one of Concord's old families, a D. funeral home. Al Ehrenfried in his 96th year, who would be with us if his health allowed to contrast this little lad at one year. <coughs> Al is a retired business owner and one of the incorporators of the Emerson Hospital. Marie Foley, 
a spirited proprietor of a store here in Concord called Revolutionary Concord. Carl Cousin, Vice President of Development and Chief Philanthropy Officer at Emerson Hospital. Lisa Lacoste, Director of Sales and Marketing at the Colonial Inn. John Martin, a developer. Bill Montague, a retailer. Kimberly Napierre, who is with Welch Foods, businesswoman and life coach. David Owen, as of two hours ago, as I mentioned, with the Concord Boy Scouts. Alison Parker, a principal of Divine, of Vervain Divine. Nicole Percoselli, Middlesex Bank. Katie Shea with Bank of America. Jim Sherbloom, retired businessman, entrepreneur, and author. Going down to the political rights panel, Diane Proctor, president of the Concord Carlisle League of Women Voters. Jane Hotchkiss, member of the Concord Select Board. Chris Whalen, Concord Town Manager. The cultural panel, Carrie Cronin, the director of the Concord Library. John Drew, vice head of Concord Academy. Jesse Floyd, the editor for the Concord Journal. Tamara Green, executive director of CCTV. Dr. Lori Hunter, superintendent of the Concord Public Schools. Edith Joachim Pali, who's with us now, entrepreneur, trustee of the Center for American Studies. John Mitchell, author, editor of Sanctuary Magazine. Ann Sussman, an architect. Dennis Taylor, professor emeritus of Boston College and former editor of Religion and the Arts. Anna Huckabee Tall, songwriter, author, life coach. Woody Woodman, entrepreneur and chair of the membership committee at Trinitarian Congregational Church. We will have students who are being determined representing the three schools, the high school, Concord Academy and Middlesex School The assistant superintendent of the prison in town will, with three prisoners, be represented. We have representatives of Concord's peace, peace groups and citizens at large, including one of Concord's honored citizens, Ruth Lauer. So this is a cast of characters to be completed further, but that begins with the Concord Nobel Prize for Peace. I want to invite my colleague on the right, if he cares to, to who's nominated an individual for the prize to give you a sense of who our eyes, our attention is turning to. Joel, would you care to say a word? Hi. Hello. Hey. Uh, I don't know. Has anybody never heard of Bob Marley? <laughs> okay, so what's there to say? <laughs> you know, you, you listen to it, it makes you feel joy even about pain. And it makes you have courage in places that you didn't know you had courage. and. Well, I wrote a thing. Let me tell a couple stories that I ran into when I was doing this. I also had an advantage. My, my younger brother was a V-Day, V-J-D-J during the reggae area when it exploded on the West Coast. Anyway, so uh, there was a concert in Rhodesia when, uh, or in Zimbabwe when Rhodesia became Zimbabwe. That's a big celebration, you know throw out the colonial folks. Anyway, the, the Bob Marley and the Whalers played to a crowd of 2.2 million for that party. That's who they were to people. And of course it ended in a police riot because you know, the police dancing, dope smoking people, offensive. Anyway, so, and then another thing I thought ran into, and this is just a legendary thing, I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, 
it came to me through my brother who's visited Jamaica and heard stories and it says basically that when he was died in a hospital he died at age 36 got sick with cancer when he was 33 he died at age 36 and when he died in the hospital a boat of lightning crashed through the front room window of his house in Jamaica hitting his portrait on the mantle destroying it so I think maybe Bob's a <laughs> still here if I had I was trying to think of if I could you know bring my laptop and stick in a music and it might be a point standing up and moving around is helpful but it's still kind of hot to get a sweat so thank you thank you there's been a nomination for Dr. Patch Adams again the nominations are one page I want to read this to get a sense of how we're proceeding. That is, when we talk about emphasizing those that are addressing the essential prerequisites of peace. Nomination of Dr. Patch Adams is cultural recipient of the Concord Nobel Prize for Peace. Dr. Patch Adams is a subject of the movie Patch Adams starring Robin Williams. The good Dr. Patch Adams is still alive and kicking in his 74th year, ever more devoted, 366 days a year, to his mission. That mission is to establish the Gesundheit Institute in the poorest county in our nation as a model hospital that addresses all of the problems of health care under one welcoming roof. With, this, with respect to the essential prerequisites for peace, Patch remains committed to his vision of medicine, not as a business that is focused on the bottom line. Rather, Dr. Patch Adams' abiding vision is of medicine as devoted to the art <laughs> and science of healing. That is, Patch sees medicine as preeminently an expression of the cultural sphere. This devotion which Patch has spoken of over the last half century in thousands of clinics, hospitals, and medical schools spanning over a hundred nations around the globe has resulted in his first-hand experience of the medical system today. Patch's conclusion is that all too often doctors don't work for their patients. Rather, if they want to be paid for their services, doctors work for those who reimburse them. Insurance companies, and often Big Pharma itself through the standards of care that increasingly exclude what has come to be referred to as natural alternative treatments once common sense. Patch's experience is that when medicine is turned into a business, a profit center on the corporation's ledgers, its focus ends up inevitably on, quote, making a killing. In this respect, he notes that iatherogenic illnesses, that is, illnesses caused by the treatment itself, have all but eclipsed cancer and heart disease as a number one cause of death. Work there is to be done, Patch feels, and the good doctor is committed to carrying on in the founding revolutionary and transcendentalist spirit of our town, Concord. I just want to read two other short nominations. Perhaps it will inspire those around the circle to consider who might be a potential recipient. This is a nomination for Laura Summers of the cultural sphere. Why I believe Laura should be considered. 
A peaceful society cannot arise when access to cultural services depends on how much money one has or depends on the political strings which are often attached to state funding via governmental agencies. Laura intentionally founded Free Columbia in Columbia County, New York to be beholden to neither economic power nor political power. Ever since it was founded in 2009, all of Free Columbia's courses and events have been offered with no mandatory fee. People can and do attend even if they have not a penny to their name. In particular, the children of the economically depressed village of Philmont, New York, have flocked to Free Columbia's no-cost art summer camps and community dramas. This requires a totally different operational model than the usual fee-based commercial model or the state-funded grant-writing model. Free Columbia is more akin to how churches or public radio are funded by unforced interest in community fundraising drives, which builds personal connections in a way that the fee model and state-funded model cannot. So the economic and the political model, since he's speaking about it, he's speaking about a cultural initiative. The foundation of a truly non-governmental, non-commercial cultural space where human talent may freely unfold is one prerequisite for a peaceable civilization. For nearly 10 years, Free Columbia has served as a humble vanguard. And lastly, a Nobel Prize nomination for Madeleine Lengel. Best known for her story, A Wrinkle in Time, Madeleine Lengel is a fabulous example of a truly human being. After overcoming a great deal of rejection, she became a prolific writer for children and adults, sharing her rich life dedicated to love and freedom. All her stories show deeply caring relationships, yet with humor and understanding for our quirky shortcomings. Madeline believed in a science that could transcend the materialistic, reductionistic perspective of our time. In fact, she was a particular uniter of science, art, and religion. In this, and in, in her appreciation of creative thinking, she has much in common with Emerson. Amazingly able to be heart-rendingly sociable and startlingly, startlingly original, Madeline was always involved in the battle to be engaged in her community whilst fashioning for herself a deep and realistic experience of what Christianity could be as a religion of love. It was a constant struggle for her to understand how a benevolent deity could allow so much suffering in the world. Madeline was a great champion of the vital role of imagination for the future of humanity. This in concert with the kindness, the religion of the Dalai Lama that permeates all her writing, make her a major, if subtle, influence towards peace in our time. So these are the first nominations. We welcome your suggestions. Again, to, be, to nominate for the Nobel Prize, you have to be a member of state, or a lawyer, or a former laureate. But we're in the new world, and we're focusing on a new world nobility for every human being, including the Minutemen, little, the little drummer boy who took the first shot from this, marching down to the bridge, a lad of 11 or 12 years old who was killed here 
we have other possibilities here in the new world and that's what the Concord Nobel Prize for Peace represents.